Hi everyone, I'm uh, Carl Alomar, Managing Partner at M13. Welcome, and uh, I have a couple of great guests on this uh, on this video to join me. So let me first introduce uh, Daria, Daria Goodnick, who actually uh, is CEO and founder of a company named Bunch.ai. Uh, Bunch is an AI leadership coach that makes it easy to learn and grow with your morning coffee. Um, and is a really incredible uh, platform that we invested in a couple of years ago and has been a great founder in our portfolio. Uh, Rob is one of the partners in the firm. He actually runs data uh, strategy, has an incredible background, actually was at DigitalOcean with me for years, built the whole data operation there and, uh, and works very closely with a lot of our founders and a lot of our portfolio companies and helping them really structure and understand their data. Um, so welcome, welcome guys. Nice to have you on board. Um, uh, I think the goal of today's conversation is really to run through an analysis that Rob led, which is really centered around how uh, executive expertise really supports and helps companies as, as they grow and some statistics to support that. And uh, Daria being kind of in the business of helping leaders become great leaders, would love to just have your thoughts and, and anecdotes and, and examples of of how support and, and experience has really kind of helped you in your journey to date and how you see that as a benefit in terms of developing leadership across businesses within the industry. So uh, Rob, I guess just start with you. I uh, would love to just understand, you know, why this paper? Why did you even think about uh, looking at this data and, and beginning to analyze, uh, you know, the, the problem set? Yeah, for sure. It was very interesting because obviously when I joined M13 and when M13 was sort of formed, uh, we had this uh, hypothesis that we think founding teams really can execute faster with a higher degree of success if they're able to take advantage of relevant expertise. That's why the firm is structured the way that it is. Um, and so it was designed really to make sure that they can get experienced leaders or executives that they wouldn't otherwise really have the money to hire or the time to really onboard, manage, and have a full-time relationship with. So um, we have this question, you know, is there any data out there that could help back up this claim? Um, is there any structured data? The answer is really no. When you look at the problem set of understanding um, the human beings who are behind successful uh, startups that become successfully exited businesses, that data is, is out there, is publicly available, um, but it's not structured or, or really collected in a, in a way that is easy to analyze. And so in order to do that, what we did was we set out and said, okay, let's look at over 800 executives at more than 200 companies that reached a sizable exit, you know, greater than uh, $500 million in exit valuation via an IPO or, or an M&A in the US, um, basically over the last 15 years. And uh, what, we, what we looked at were really companies that fit um, into the kind of exit trajectory and model that we invest in. So we excluded some bio uh, biotech and life sciences companies, um, which you know, follow different trajectories in terms of when they're, when they're acquired. Um, so we focused on consumer tech and B2B tech, any traditional tech IPOs. Um, and uh, you know, we can go into the findings now. I can, I can ruin the surprise or we can sort of talk about- No, let's, let's tease it out. Let's tease it out a little bit. I'd love to, I'd love to throw you in here, Dara. You, you've built a business around the idea that that strong leadership and, and developing, you know, uh, skills, which obviously happens over time, really drives to, to greater success in the workplace. I mean, what, uh, what were your thoughts on kind of this thesis and, and have you, you know, any ideas around how you're trying to contribute into the whole idea of building experience or building capabilities from a leadership standpoint? Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having me, of course, and super excited to hear the results of uh, the story and your take on it, Rob. Um, we are pretty much on in the same mission or on the same mission, right? Um, I think as M13 Bunch is also really inspired by the idea of what would happen to the world if we actually um, don't fail businesses and we don't actually kind of get stuck on the way, but we actually resolve problems really effectively and we collaborate effectively and really um, make innovation come to life. And leadership obviously plays a huge role because I think next to timing to market, that's like the second reason. Um, so team issues, team ineffectiveness, um, any type of kind of negative consequences of uh, failing leadership are usually the responsible factors for startups not working out or innovation not actually coming to fruition. So um, we are really 
um, standing behind our, our mission to actually enable everyone that is signing up to lead and wants to either build a business, build a team, um, help products come to life to be able to do so. And I think the um, core idea behind the way I think we interpret leadership is that leadership means that you can impact yourself and others in a positive way. And that it's also a behavioral set more like more than a personality type of um, characteristic. So you don't actually have to be born a great leader, but you have to show up, you have to do the work and you have to put in the work on a daily basis to really make progress. And I think it actually ties very nicely and is complementary to what M13 is kind of um, positioning with the idea of, well, if you don't have the time to actually kind of learn it all on your own and that the 1% better every day is actually not going to get you there fast enough, you can absolutely partner with great experienced leaders in specific areas that actually can bring you that knowledge. And um, I think from a personal point of view, and I have many anecdotes there, but I'm gonna hold them back for now, but I definitely yeah. would agree that it is extremely helpful. And I do think you need to do both as a business leader and especially as an early founder, you never have enough um, expertise, I don't think, because you wear too many hats. And so collaborating with experienced leaders is very, um, useful and beneficial, but at the same time, you do need to put your own work and you, you need to make your own progress as well. And the 1% today is kind of um, a mandatory must-have criteria to do as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're always learning, we're always growing. I think one of the, the greatest, uh, you know, learnings of my life uh, in developing as a leader is the idea that you never stop learning. And so putting that effort in and putting that uh, education in is, is definitely valuable. Um, I think an interesting other aspect of it is um, we, uh, you know, no matter how good you are as a founder, um, you know, and Dara, you're a great founder, so you, you could be a great example for this, but I, I definitely found this in my career. There is always uh, going to be uh, blind spots in the early days of business. There are always a lack of resources, which don't necessarily allow you to have the right intelligence at the table for a particular problem set. And I've definitely found myself over the years lose a significant amount of time spinning around uh, simple issues, you know, simple for some people, but complex for people that just don't have the experience and haven't had the knowledge. And, and that's really part of the ethos and the premise by which we built M13 and built the whole propulsion platform. So, I mean, um, Daria, I, I know you let me tease one anecdote out of you, but you know, what we've tried to do, and, and I know, you know, very personally, the relationship we've had, but what we've tried to do is really support you in times when you have uh, hit a problem, which even though you have a fantastic team, may have a gap or may have a blind spot and just kind of want to lean on expertise to, to help solve. You, do you have um, any anecdotes or any, any kind of examples of perhaps where that's happened and where we've been helpful in that regard? Absolutely. I think I actually have two that tie nicely together. And the first one goes um, into the very, very beginning of um, my journey with M4 Team, but moreover with you, Carl, of course, I think we've um, had the session on um, while you were still a DO, I think, actually, when we really just stood in front of a whiteboard. I had so many strategic loose ends and I was kind of trying to bring it all together. How does the GTM align with the actual product strategy? And it was hard for me, I remember to zoom out because I was so caught up in the details and I was like, so like thinking so deeply for too long time about it probably at this point in time. And I think you came in and you kind of really helped me structure and zoom out and it really turned the company around and led to us actually working together um, when you joined M13 and became a really true partnership between both companies. Um, and the second um, example is actually a very important one um, and is um, a very authentic one. And I think showcases how impactful such a partnership can be. Um, we just recently actually um, have kind of, uh, yeah, graduated our product from an MVP that grew very quickly. We went for a couple of hundred users to a few thousand in like less than three months, I think. And of course, overall, this um, poses, um, yeah, risks, but also um, drains kind of the technological setup and the system. And I think in this case, um, it came in very handy that as a former COO, you of course had so much experience around scaling technology, how to actually address tech debt and how to um, really roadmap change and kind of where to look out for. And I think in that sense, it was really crucial for us as a founding team to have that guidance and not to just, you know, jump on like 
solution ideas that we kind of code ourselves out uh, with and, and instead again taking a strategic view and really roadmap change for the company and solidify the infrastructure and the architecture that we are building towards so that was extremely like on a personal level very useful and helpful but i think for the business it was extremely valuable well i definitely appreciate the recognition that's very kind of you um i don't want this to feel like a uh, self-beneficial um uh uh, interview that we're doing, but <laughs> but I do appreciate that, and I think it's it. It, it did really help. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely resonates across the firm. It's something that we do. You know, uh, all our partners do with multiple different founders. I, I think that would that leads me, uh, Rob, to kind of the the next little component of uh, of the plan, and and maybe I'll just ask you about you know the, the baselines. I know that there are two key things that you were looking at. Um, you know, length, a time to exit, as well as, um, you know, size of exit. And maybe you can talk to what the industry standards were and what you were seeing uh, as, a, as a traditional trajectory. Um, and sure. then how perhaps that related to um, the level of expertise or level of experience that lived within the team. Yeah, very relevant to what you were just saying. You know, if we're going to help uh, early teams see around corners, we're trying to help them save time. And we know that time is ultimately one of the key variables to how um, well an investment performs and how well a company performs. You know, time time is money. And so one of the first things we did when we gathered, um, you know, we, we manually compiled from publicly available data sources on the Internet, but, you know, had to compile this data set of 800 executives. Um, it was really validate sort of this this sort of industry wide um, uh, held notion that the average successful exit usually takes seven to eight years, um, and we actually saw precisely that. You know, in the data that we collected, we measured it based on our our manually uh, constructed data set, and we validated that it's exactly what we saw. And so when we started to actually then segment out, okay. We compiled dozens of different characteristics on the individual leaders who were part of these companies at different points in time as that company progressed from startup to successfully exited company. And so we know who joined, when they joined, and what their experience was prior to joining. And so we can attach variables like had they had a prior leadership role um, in the same field at a separate company. Um, and so we started to be able to slice the data that way. And what we saw was our first big finding was um, really that, that startups that have uh, multiple founders, so two or more people who were there at the beginning, um, who have some sort of prior leadership role or executive experience, those companies actually exit 33% faster. Um, and so instead of the traditional average that we saw of seven to eight years, we were seeing 4.7 years for those companies. That's amazing. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, time is money. So that does uh, probably uh, relate to the amount that they raised and uh, kind of the IRR ultimately that, that results for the, uh, you know, early investors in these businesses. You, perhaps you can elaborate a little further and and share some of the findings around IRR and around uh, yes. you know, volume of funds raised. So the second big variable, obviously, in how well an investment performs is how much money you had to put into it, right? And so um, if we're helping companies exit faster, um, we theoretically should help them also need to re raise less capital. And so we, we looked at um, uh, both the amount of capital raised and the size of exit. And similarly, what we saw was for companies that had greater than uh, one, so two or more founders um, with prior leadership and executive experience in their field, they raised 34% less capital um, than, than other companies, than the companies that didn't have that experience at the table um, early on. And so you combine those two things together, 33% faster and 34% less capital. Um, if you look at an average scenario where a company achieves a $500 million exit, let's say, um, the theoretical IRR for a Series A lead investor who's investing, let's say, $10 million for 15% starting ownership, 
and you progress that through time, that total IRR actually improves by 81%. And so you're nearly doubling your rate of return simply by making sure the, the founding team at that seed and A stage um, you know, has the access to um, relevant leadership experience around the table to help them see around corners and just progress up the J-curve that much faster um, and be able to avoid some of the common pitfalls that may fall outside of the founding team's areas of expertise and where they they might traditionally spend a lot of cycles and a lot of you know energy and resources um, and, and diverting that away from their core competencies and the main value proposition for their product. Yeah, I, I think um, it's it's really interesting because you know we, we see it ourselves as companies are able to achieve um, you know better results, faster results, valuations go up, uh, the amount raised early goes up. But as a result, the overall amount raised because the you know less rounds need to be done. I know at DigitalOcean, we only really did three uh, formal rounds of investment that really got us to kind of a critical growth phase. Um, you know, a lot of companies out there will do plenty more than that. But I think that you know, you know, partly luck, partly experience, I guess. But we really you know had navigated how to manage our capital effectively, how to get through problems effectively, and and you know get to a really good outcome as a result. Um, so Daria, just in, in terms of, you know, talking about investors and kind of, uh, you know, taking advantage of knowledge like this as a CEO, how do you think about um, the benefits uh, that an investor can provide outside of pure capital that, again, could, you know, could result in, maybe I'm leading the witness here, but could result in, you know, these potential outcomes where you do have, uh, you know, faster road to market, faster, you know, less requirements for funding in the future, et cetera. Yeah, maybe actually before I address this point, I just wanted to share one more thought kind of following up on, on the results, because I, first of all, I think it's a tremendously valuable study and it um, is so great to see that we kind of are actually having data on this point. Um, in our current environment where I think we're all also very kind of driven and motivated by giving more and more access to like a wide and diverse pool of founders that may or may not have prior experience. Um, given that data as an investor, I would now basically conclude like I either have founders that have prior experience to increase the chances of success and to reduce time, or I make sure that these founders do have that expertise in order to kind of find the same shortcut. So I think it just plays into that same um, argument that it actually is even more important to team up with experienced and um, expertise driven leadership if you want to actually fund um, diverse pool of founders that may or may not have that. Um, but on your question or to your question, Kyle, I think, I mean, obviously the number one kind of benefit is that this like looking around corners. And I think it, it actually stuck with me for a little bit when you mentioned for the first time and I was like, oh, that's an interesting concept actually. And I think it comes back to like, experience blueprints or almost templates. So being in the business day to day and kind of grinding away at it, right? And building and building and building, you have all the data. That's, you have data every day. Things change all around you with your users and customers, with your people on the team, in the market. And oftentimes the challenge for a founder or for a CEO in particular is to understand what is actual signal? Like, what do I need to pay attention to at any given moment in time? And I think when, you work and collaborate with um, people that have been in it for a few years, they bring relevant frameworks and blueprints to the table and help you to look at that data from a particular perspective. You don't have to take that perspective, but just looking through it and being able to like see it from different points of view um, has made it possible for me to make decisions quicker because I've been kind of simulating scenarios in my head. And with that sparring, I'm able to do that better. I think on just also a founder level, and I think that doesn't get talked um, enough about, is the emotional journey of building a business is a very taxing one. As we all know, it's a very challenging kind of, it's a very rewarding and challenging kind of journey. So having partners in crime or in building is definitely also very important. And I think if you actually can build a trustful relationship with your investors and really look at them as advisors that always helps me like my mental model is these are my advisors of course we have a common goal and we're a team but in the end some of these people at least are very um experienced and and have a perspective that i value and i need in order to make better decisions so um it's kind of this like 
counsel, like my advisory counsel type of framework that I use, at least in my mind. And I think that's just very helpful for making better decisions. Um, and there is tons of other benefits as well, but these would these two would be the most important ones for me, I think. And of course, introductions to like networks and contacts that um, you already have and have met and I haven't yet. And that like the opening doors is always extremely helpful. But I think this is something that we can like hustle through as founders in the end. I actually don't think that's the biggest value add. It's really the perspective and like the mental capability to help make better decisions in my mind. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's definitely the thesis by which we built the, the firm. And uh hopefully it feels like we're we're pulling through and, and helping you you know at that level and so hopefully that you know that keeps you uh very engaged with with how we're approaching this problem set but um but i know we have a great partnership Definitely. I know you've with a number of the members of the team on, on a number of different problems um but i totally agree i mean having been a founder myself um definitely you know very much looking for a partnership rather than just an investment and so that's really what we've striven, strove to, to build here. Um, we are running uh, tight on time. So just maybe to, to wrap things up, I'd love to understand, Rob, if you have um, kind of the next step plan, what, where does this go? What do you, what do you think uh, the follow-up to this analysis will be as you go into the future? Yeah, there are so many ways to further this analysis. I mean, at the end of the day, we're analyzing human beings, right? And human beings don't fit nicely into sort of quantitative metrics, uh, you know, most of the time. And so when we're trying to gather and understand the key variables that, that contribute to founder success, the list is just infinite. And so when we think about trying to go a step further, we would love to actually engage more deeply with some of these successful companies and do deeper, um, you know, surveying and information to understand some of the different attributes around the life experiences and the different um, professional experiences that have played a part in, in sort of creating some of these leaders and contributing to how they are successful um, at the companies that then we're, we're looking at because they are successful. Um, and so, you know, one layer deeper is really to try and go from what's publicly available to engaging and trying to get a deeper, more granular understanding of people's experience. And just to be clear, you know, just so people understand the realm of analysis, we're talking about companies like Spotify, Zoom, Uber, Peloton, you know, pretty, pretty well-known household names in terms of tech businesses. And so um, it's interesting to kind of look at their past and see what, what brought them to where they are today. Well, with that being said, we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rob and Daria. Um, very kind of you guys to join. This is a great conversation. I think we could go on for another hour talking about this. But, uh, but for now, we, we are out of time. So thank you very much. And uh, look forward to continuing to work with you, Daria, and, uh, and obviously Rob as one of our partners to, to work alongside you. Thank you. Same. Thank you so hey, much. Thank you.